So this is backward and forward compatibility challenge in country models. Uh, this is a core conversation. So thanks for coming, everyone. And I hope that uh, I will give some context of the topic and some personal experience we had. But I invite everyone to, to get the, to the mic and share your thoughts. So my name is Christian Lopez. I'm Peñasquito on Drupal Dotor. Uh, I've been contributing to Drupal for some time, mainly in the multilingual initiative. And uh, that helped me to get a new job at Lingotech, where we help people translate and localize their sites. So uh, this is not about multilingual or Lingotech, but I will give a bit of context. So you know uh, what we do and why we face the challenge that we had. So my main job there is building a Drupal 8 module uh, which connects Drupal to a translation management system. And this means using Drupal APIs for extracting content, uploading somewhere, downloading it. Uh, and in this journey, we had some challenge, and this is why we are here. So in, Bal uh, in Baltimore, Bim Lears talk about backwards compatibility already, and this slide is, is from him. Uh, during the Drupal 8 cycle, uh, Dries announced that uh, we will have backward compatibility and we will have semantic versioning for that, which means that uh, people is supposed to be able to upgrade their sites to the latest version, which is, of course, a huge benefit uh, without any, any issues. But sometimes things happen and things don't go as, as expected. So Beam came with uh, three different types of APIs in Baltimore. Uh, explicit APIs, which are like hooks, plugin, tag services. Implicit APIs, which is the markup structure, render array structure, and the wakes and priorities for the order of calling uh, different models. And some accidental APIs, which are main interfaces, so when we introduce uh, object-oriented uh, code in Drupal. Most of the classes there were, were came with an interface. And people assume that these interfaces are part of the API. So in the case of explicit APIs, uh, the way of uh, maintaining backward compatibility is uh, not trying to change them. But in the case of implicit APIs, sometimes we avoid to change it, but if it's needed, we, we, will, we will change it in, in core. And one example we had is uh, for, in Lingotech, a uh, test code uh, for saving a node. We, we had different, we, in Drupal 8.4, it changed uh, how we saved, like the button level for saving content. Now for the status, if it's published or not, we have a checkbox. So uh, we need to call different uh, buttons for submitting the form. And in the case we have uh, content moderation enabled in 8.3 or 8.4, this also change. So one example for implicit API change, what we did is like trying to abstract uh, these uh, changes in a method. So we can control which uh, things we will need to clean up later. Another uh, issue we had is uh, f for great tests. Uh, in our case, we have like a, a lot of tests, and uh, <coughs> this gives us some random failures with uh, the test bots. Uh, this will come later. And one thing that we, we see is uh, in Drupal ecosystem, it's really important to, to have different integrations. So when we develop our country models, uh, we need some way of saying which models we are compatible with and which versions of these models. And one way we currently can use, aside of having uh, uh, the text of the project description, is a uh, the list of dependencies in our releases. It's quite hidden, but if you go to the release page, you have there all the dependencies and the current versions that are used. 
uh, in this case, these are extracted from the test. So this, these are the optional dependencies that we uh, have for our test. Uh, and this is like, uh, we are recursing this dependency list. So we, we have some, some dependencies there which are not really useful for end users that uh, want to see what uh, modules this module is compatible with or which integrations do we have. So we should probably figure out uh, better ways of explaining this to, to, to users. Uh, and when we talk with, uh, when we talk about the integrations that we support with different country models, uh, we find another challenge, which is uh, uh, which versions of those models we are compatible with. Uh, there's an issue uh, about uh, adding semantic versioning in country. Uh, like in core, it was really helpful, uh, and I guess when when country still evolves well more, this will be really useful for for explicit for making explicit with uh, versions you are compatible with. And when we talk about backward and forward compatibility, uh, one thing that we have is uh, how we uh, test against different versions of different models and. Uh, there are multiple combinations, so this, uh, the, the number of tests that we should actually run for ensuring that we are compatible with those versions of those country models uh, grows quite in a factorial way. So uh, one thing we could do for improving the situation is uh, using uh, some research. This was presented in... Uh, in Barcelona, in Drupalcon Barcelona. It, it was a call called Smart Test Proposal Accelerating Detection Faults in Drupal. This comes from research from uh, a woman who works for the University of Seville, and she presented this work in, in Barcelona. So what they used was a, a software product line research approach uh, for, for doing prioritization techniques to a scheduling test. So they ended up developing a model which is called a smart test, which uh, changed how simple test, uh, tests are run in which order, depending on which are more, uh, which have been, uh, which tests have been fail, failing more often. So you run these tests first and you can uh, see more quickly uh, which uh, tests are failing. So using something like this in, in Drupal or or, and, or test bots could be useful for when you have so many combinations for running tests, this could be uh, a useful approach for, for getting feedback as soon as possible. But this uh, will be quite costly in terms of development. Like we know how hard it is to push change to Drupal.org infrastructure and the test bots. So another way uh, could be gathering uh, data from users. So this is something that WordPress used to do. Uh, I couldn't find it anymore. So maybe, I don't know why they stopped uh, using it. But they used to, in every module page or plugin page, as they call them, they had a compatibility box. And if you were registered on the system, you could uh, say which setup are you using and if it worked or not for you. But this could be like for supporting core minor releases or, or major releases. This could be quite helpful. But we should really look how, how to make this scalable when you have like a lot of country models that you also want to, to check uh, which ones are compatible, you are compatible with. Uh, I want also to show some issues that we find on, on the way of grading our model and making it compatible with other stuff. So uh, first I, I should start, like in the Lingotech model started quite before Drupal 8 was actually released. 
So we didn't have a lot of examples to look at. And one, one decision we take is we, we need to store data about uh, every entity so we know if we have uploaded it yet to our platform or not, and some kind of metadata that we save. And for that, what we use is that we, we added uh, fields. Uh, altering the entities, we added fields to, to any entity that we mark that we want to, to integrate with Lingotech. Uh, and at the end, it, this wasn't a, a good solution, especially when you, uh, when you start supporting revisions, and then uh, where events moderation appears, and your data is stored in different revisions, so this wasn't uh, a good solution. And we use this in the uh, 8.x, 1x branch. So we created an 8.x, uh, 2x branch, which uh, used a different entity for storing this uh, kind of uh, metadata. We took this approach for, for actually for, from the content moderation module, which is now in core as an experimental module. And what they did is like they have a different entity and they load this entity dynamically, so you don't really need to store anything in the original entity. Uh, and it makes uh, everything easy easier. Uh, but then uh, when we wrote our grade path, we wanted to remove uh, the, uh, the fields that we added in the previous version, and we found that, that it wasn't possible. So there's an issue for that, and I'm really happy that there's some work going on in the sprints this week about uh, parking uh, base fields data. So when you have uh, data in these fields, you cannot delete it, which actually means that if you had Lingotech before and you want to uninstall it, you cannot because there's data existing in the system and you cannot uh, really purge it. So, so yeah, so this is something that affect, affected us and it may happen to you if you are uh, creating country models. Uh, another thing, uh, this is one that I didn't face myself, but uh, Fabian Bircher sent it to me. Uh, there's an issue about updating models with new service dependencies. So if you are updating a model which have a service dependency uh, that comes from a new model that it's not in the system, when you try to install this model, uh, the container is rebuilt and this service doesn't exist yet. So uh, Drupal will crash. Uh, and this is something that people is working on in this sprint too. So these are most of the issues we have about backward compatibility. Another one is forward compatibility. So one thing we wanted to do is, uh, is uh, making uh, our module compatible with, uh, with content moderation, but we had clients that were using Warbench moderation already and then we had clients on 8.2, which may be using the content moderation experimental model. Um, people who are going to, to upgrade to 8.4 uh, with uh, content moderation, and we want to, once uh, the release comes out, we want to support it. So in this case, what we had to do is like creating a, a, fac a facet li layer where we, uh, where we can uh, provide a, a common API for all of this, uh, and using uh, using the service service collector, we can uh, inject different services, uh, even from different country models. If there's another moderation solution that comes afterwards. So in this case, what what we use for forward compatibility is trying to extract uh, these features into into, um, into our code, uh, which I don't think it makes sense to, to abstract it to a different model because I'm not sure if some people will have this kind of uh, situation, but this is what it worked for us. So I tried to give you some context. Uh, so summarizing situation, it's much better than Drupal 7, but there are still some challenges. I highlighted some issues we encountered in the way. Uh, some of the problems we had, 
uh, will require chains to Drupal.org and, and to the test bot. And this could be quite uh, hard to do. Uh, one thing that we usually found is uh, we need better communication, even better communication. Like um, when people see something in core, they assume that it will work and experimental means experimental. So in, in case of uh, content moderation, uh, some clients uh, were expecting that we work with them and, and we didn't support them yet. The importance of updating to, to the last releases, uh, most of these problems wouldn't happen if every client uh, were using the last uh, release of every module and, and core, but at the end, they, they usually uh, are slower to catch up. And after this, I would love to have a conversation and see which actions we could take for, for improving the, the current situation. So I invite everyone who which wants to share his or her thoughts to the mic. Just some bibliography. Uh, I got content from Making Drupal Upgrades Easy Forever, the article from Dries, where they announced uh, this, uh, the, the semantic versioning. Uh, backwards compatibility, burden and benefit from being Lears, uh, which was made in Baltimore and Seville, and the smartest uh, <coughs> talk from Barcelona. And there are some research papers about the subject. Link from there if you are interested of knowing more. So, everyone wants to share? Hi, I'm Jess. I'm one of the Drupal 8 core release managers. Um, I did want to highlight um, on your previous slide where you had your summary, and then you asked what are some actions we can take. Um, around the communication, the better communication for experimental means experimental, and uh, trying to navigate the problem of content moderation in 8.2x being totally a huge BC break with content moderation in 8.3x and 8.4x. Um, we actually have changed the experimental module process so that won't ever happen again. Um, so in the future, in, we will not release alpha level experimental modules in core. And what that means is that um, if, you, if any code is added to core, it must provide backwards compatibility and an upgrade path um, within, within a major release. So um, in the future, what we would do is if a module, an experimental module has only alpha stability and they're not ready to support the API yet, um, we will remove the module from core before the next minor release is released. So let's say we add the workspaces module in Drupal 8.5x. Um, if, if it turns out that workspaces is not ready to support backwards compatibility and an upgrade path, by the time 8.5's alpha is going to be released in January, we will remove it from the 8.5x branch of Drupal core, put it in 8.6x only, um, and then continue to do that until Workspaces is ready to support a, a data to module. So that, that one thing we have addressed already. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight um, one thing related to, you had the first slide about um, uh, explicit APIs, implicit APIs, and quote, accidental APIs. Um, we actually have a slightly different way of framing this in the core um, definition of what the APIs are. If you go to drupal.org slash core slash d8 hyphen allowed hyphen changes, um, yeah, 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 um, that page has a very, very long textual list that explains um, e for each type of thing in Drupal, um, whether we consider it a public API, an internal API, or not an API. So for example, um, a hook is considered a public API. So we will provide backward compatibility for hooks within a minor version. Um, but a render array uh, in the implicit API example, that's considered an internal API. So that page has a very long text definition of what the APIs are, um, but that's obviously not very useful for developers. Like you're not going to every time say, okay, I have um, this base class and I, there's this method on it that's public, is that API or not? I don't know. Um, if you go to that page, it says in text, what we're doing now is in the process, we're in the process of adding an at internal tag to everything in Drupal core that is actually 
not considered public API. So for example, a hook implementation would not be public API. You should never call a procedural function that happens to be a hook implementation directly. And what we're going to do is label all of the hook implementations in core with at internal. If you want to help out with that, we're sprinting on it this week. Um, tomorrow, it'll actually be in the mentored sprint room. There will probably be a table that says, like, at internal in big labels, come find us and help, and then you can help make it so that um, in the future, it's more clear to developers whether or not they can rely on that API. So, two good Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there was anything uh, Core could do or maybe individual contrib modules to make it harder to either turn on experimental modules, like maybe you had to go into settings.php and put a thing to say, I'm going to run experimental. Or if contrib modules um, potentially, especially for something that you know could potentially mess with your storage, um, to say, to actually check to see if content moderation is on and say, yeah. There's also an issue for that. I'll find it and give you the okay. note ID. Um, but, but potentially, without core doing that, you could still say, hey, content moderation is on. Let's on every Lingo Tech administration page say, you know, we know this is a, this could be a problem. You know, have you, do you know that you're running an experimental module? Do you guys put any warnings or um, for that? We are not doing that. Okay. So we actually do that like uh, for adding settings, like uh, this experimental module is supported, so these are the settings related to that one. Yeah. But we are not doing something like that, and I guess uh, with uh, what J XJM said uh, about this won't happen again. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's, it's not that relevant anymore. So, so if somebody's making a project with Composer, though, are they gonna have that same not? Like, if I'm making a if I'm making a project, and I think it's gonna be a year out, so I do Composer and I require like a next branch of Drupal. Uh, if I was like developing against 8.5 now, I would still have that problem, right? Well, yeah, if you use a development release, there's never been any issues with any of that. Yeah. So yeah. we assume that if you know that if you're running on a pre-release version, it's your full Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, also, one way uh, the experimental models are actually in core is to increase visibility. Yeah. So hiding them, it's probably not yeah. a good idea from a different country model. Thank you. Uh, the, the core issue to add a flag, um, the implementation it suggests in the core issue is a settings.php flag. Um, that's drupal.org slash node slash 2907162. Um, this is something that came out of the experimental module policy change I was talking about as an additional suggestion. So what it would be is on a site-by-site -site basis, um, administrators could opt in to showing experimental modules or not. To, so that, you know, if it's in a development, like, and we have, there's the settings.local.php for, that's in, you can set up differently, like, a, as a development environment. So we would probably include it so that that enables the flag to allow you to try experimental modules so people who can use it on a development site. But then on a production site, it would be off by default or on the default installation of Drupal, so. Um, so Drupal core tends to add new features in minor releases, especially like for the entity API. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm still in the process of writing the group module and I want to make use of that. So every time there's a new minor release, I go looking for the change records for what's new. And I'm like, oh shit, we've got a default HTML route provider now. I want to use that instead of, you know, um, mm -hmm having my own routes in there so I can reduce the module size. But that means that from that point on, my module requires score eight point, in that case it was one, I believe, point zero. And then in eight point, three point, whatever, something new comes along and I'm like, oh shit, I wanna use this. So I do. And what I find myself doing so far is just updating my project page every time with like big ass letters at the top saying requires score whatever, 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 just to make it real clear to people that if the module worked for you on Drupal 8.2 and I added in new features that have only landed in core 8.3, it will no longer work properly on 8.2 or it will be missing stuff that I had in place that now core has so I can toss it out of my own module. Um, so how do you fix that problem where, I, I mean, I don't want to keep having to update my project page saying, you know, use this core version or use that, uh, use that core version. So how, you, how would you 
go about that? So one way is uh, you can, in your info YAML file, you can say the minimal core version you support yeah. or your composer JSON. So this can prevent people to actually install it. I yeah, think. I, I know that. It's just, that's not intuitive enough. Yeah, and especially, uh, yeah, this is the problem I highlight <laughs> here. Like, how can we make uh, easier for users to see this? In, in it's especially because it's like, it's an upgrade path. So it used to support 8.2, and then because 8.3 has new features, it now requires 8.3. So I'm basically telling people, like, as long as you keep up to date with core, the module will keep working, which I guess is a good thing to tell people. But some people are you know, afraid of that because they're still afraid of doing core updates. Yeah. So uh, yeah. They should be afraid not to do yeah. core updates. <laughs> yeah. The, every time, so as soon as 8.4 comes out, 8.3 is no longer supported at all. Um, so they should be, as Jeff said, they should be afraid of continuing to use old versions. Like, I agree there could be a usability improvement and maybe a confidence booster, but there, as a contrib author, you should only be worried about supporting yeah, the latest yeah, one. Of yeah, you're just, you're just it, as you said, factorially in increasing the number of, the amount of work you have to do. Um, so, yeah, the, the dependencies way is the safest way to protect yourself against it. I agree it's not the most uh, uh, easy to, you know, it's not the most helpful way of, of explaining to them that like it's broken now. But eventually everyone will figure it out, maybe, I don't know, or we can help them along the way. But it's, it's, it's good for them to not be able to use old versions of core because it's not supported at all. Yeah, I was just gonna add a comment about um, Composer. So talking about like what your Composer minimum requirements are for core, I mean, it would be good to be able to expose that information on the project page, you know, rather than have to go in there and say, you know, you need this particular version. If we're able to expose that on the project page, I mean, um, it's the kind of ongoing issue, I guess, of, of the fact that people want to click a download button versus Composer install things, but um, it's just an idea. Um, I'm just going to share one of these kind of update the latest core problems with backwards compatibility. I was in the session about Drush 9. And the problem now is Drush 8 supports Drupal 8.3. It will not fully support 8.4 because Symfony is upgraded from version 2 to version 3. And um, so they have developed Drush 9, but the problem is we manage our site using Agar and it's reliant very much on uh, Drush commands. And I got this kind of panic because in a week, our hosting environment will not be supported at all. Kind of, how do we do? Because I need to upgrade core, uh, and I don't want to be uh, in an older version. And the problem there, I found a solution uh, how to fix the provision part of Agar so it can install 8.4 pages because it couldn't. Uh, but we're using a Drush version that is not supported. So um, I don't have a good solution uh, how to solve this because Drush 9 is not in stable mode and Drush 8 is not supporting the new one. So it's a problem. <laughs> So I'd like to reassure you a little bit about that. It's, it, that's, what, that's what was the case for a while. Um, but thanks to some work that Greg Anderson, who's one of the Drush maintainers, did, um, you can use... So the, what it actually is is that you can't... Um, global installations of Drush 9 are not supported. Um, and so if you use a global installation of Drush and Drupal 8, there was a situation where or you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able, or sorry, and Drush 8, you, you were sort of like stuck. But Greg Anderson did do some work, so it is actually possible to update core um, from 8.3 to 8.4 using Drush um, in, in Drush 8.1.12. Um, so if you use Drush in a, in a global workflow um, on your host, be sure, be sure, be sure to update Drush to 8.1.12 before the release of Drupal 8.4, before you use it up to update to Drupal 8.4, and you should be okay. Um, they, they, they don't want to say that they're supporting it, but it, it actually works just fine. Um, so 
it's, it's not quite as dire as all that, so, but I think a lot of people went through the same panic because at first they're saying that we, they weren't going to support it at all. It's actually okay. What might actually just happen is that um, new feature development might not you know, be available. And so what you want to do in the longer term is, is try to switch to uh, like a local composer-based um, setup for your sites for, for future compatibility, but in the immediate future for the next month and then six months later for 8.5, you should be okay. Mostly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the most problem for us is Ager is reliant on multi sites. So we have like 40 sites on one core. And uh, to kind of split that into have separate composers. So for us, it's kind of we need to figure out either Ager needs to be fixed or we need to change our hosting uh, f philosophy about it. So. Yep. Hello. So I have uh, one maybe suggestion. Uh, you mentioned one of the problems, maybe uh, the order where you uh, that you run the test uh, of with the, all the optional dependencies, uh, and for that specific problem, uh, if if the test is a PHP unit test. Uh, there is uh, one tag that is depends, and I have just grabbed core, mm -hmm. and they are, I, there is already like 10 or 15 uh, instances of depends in the test. So that's a way to actually enforce <coughs> that uh, the order of dependencies without needing to to u change test bots uh, mm -hmm. because they will PHP unit would be the one actually doing the the, the order of the test. Yeah, that works uh, when you are testing uh, one version, but the thing is that what I was talking about is maybe trying to to test, uh, run your test with different environments too. But yeah, I think it, that can be helpful too, yeah. Okay. Um, like a long while ago, I was following the issue about um, having SEM version or semantic versioning for uh, country modules. And there was a discussion back then, and I haven't really followed it since, so I wanted to see whether there was like an update on it. But the whole idea was that um, modules need to support a certain Drupal version. So um, you have a module for Drupal 7, you have a module for Drupal 8. So this is why we have like 7.x-1.1.x. Uh, um, so how how... How far along have we come uh, with trying to find a solution for that? So when you want to have like a module 1.0.0 for Drupal 7, and uh, you also want to have that 1.0.0 for Drupal 8, so how will we handle that? Because basically you'll just have like, um, especially for a composer, like Drupal slash, let's say, group dash 1.0.0, uh, and you, you don't really know whether that's like Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. So um, has there been a solution for that yet? or? Is that still a little bit up in the air? So there's still a discussion about it. Uh, so, sorry. So there, there are still ongoing discussions about it, and uh, so the the last proposed thing I saw is uh, composing the major version with uh, the eight prefix in case of eight or seven in case of seven. Uh, but yeah, this is like a very long discussion still. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of like uh, unsubscribed from that discussion because <laughs> it kept going back and forth and everyone, like every 50 comments, the same solutions would come up again. Like people weren't, you know, bothering reading everything before that. So yeah, I kind of just like zoned out and was like, okay, never mind. This isn't moving anywhere. I mean, I think really the solution is to just actually fully use Composer for your own from feature to feature. Right? So, like, you, we don't, there's no expectation that um, for, for other dependencies that, that are, there's no expectation that Drupal's version number somehow encodes the version of Symphony that we depend on. Um, so, I think that, you know, Composer is the way that 
Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was just saying that I think that really the only long-term solution to the problem is is for um, the for the Drupal ecosystem to just actually adopt Composer to manage dependencies, but because um, like Drupal core doesn't include some expectation in its own version number of what Symfony versions it uses, for example. So, but that's that's my that's just my personal opinion. That's not actually a, a direction that we've necessarily chosen. Um, so what you, what you just said, I, I, I agree with that. Like we, we need to use Composer from now on. Um, one of the comments I remember reading is that, um, say I have a 1.0.0, which is for Drupal 7, and then um, I can list Drupal 7 as a dependency in Composer, but then I release a, um, a new version for Drupal 8, and I'm sort of forced to call it 2.0.0 because I need to list Drupal 8 as a dependency. And then you get like this weird versioning because then I may use that version 2 to backport all of the uh, cool stuff I wrote for that to Drupal 7, but that would be version 3. And then if I wanted to update like for Drupal 8 or Drupal 9, that would be version nine, uh, version 4. And then you'd get this weird scenario where in true sem semantic versioning, like the first number is like this is a new major release. So you'd have two releases for Drupal 8, one being 2.0.0 and one being 4.0.0 or something. And that doesn't really make sense because everyone's going to be wondering, like, what happened to number one and three? Yeah, okay, so I, I just recall that being part of the discussion and I, I wonder whether, like, because like prefixing it with an eight <coughs> seems like introducing just another Drupalism to me because there's going to be someone who's got like 21 version of his module and then he's jumping from like uh, 89 to 810, which is like very weird. Um, the, the question I was going to ask, though, is if you're backporting new functionality to Drupal 7, why, wouldn't, wouldn't, why would that be a new major version number? So if you're making backwards compatible API additions, that sh that's allowable within a minor version. So you can add new APIs to the minor version. So why wouldn't it be like in 1.1.0, for example? Um, generally, because when I want to backport some stuff from Drupal 8 to Drupal 7, it means I realize I fucked up. And it's <laughs> like, uh, so it's definitely not back. Yeah, yeah, so it's definitely not BC. Yeah. But anyways, I, yeah, so uh, I, I guess it's still like ongoing, but I mean, I just wanted to like have my concerns on the recording, like, you know, prefixing eight seems something weird, and then jumping from version two to four seems weird as well, but as the guy in the back of the room said, maybe that is like the right approach. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the way that we solved that problem in, in Drupal was to have completely separate um, packages repositories, right, for seven and eight. So again, it's the, what we're doing in Compose is different from what you're seeing on, on project pages. Like that stuff's not, not surfaced. Really. Um, and the other thing I was just going to mention was, as a comment, is that you know, a lot of this, a lot of the times we're, we're, we're kind of putting more burden on um, the maintainers of Drupal.org to say, oh, we need this feature and that feature, and they've got a massive, massive backlog of, of work. Um, so I, mean, I think if we can think of solutions, maybe we can think of ways that we can solve this without adding more burden on them, you know, like to, to do it. And because in reality, a lot of this stuff, if we ask for it, it's probably not going to get done for a long time. So. To this, there is a Drupal.org panel where we may learn about what is uh, what, yeah. what is possible and what the time frame would be. Um, I, I will also add that um, if, if people saw the Dries note on Tuesday, um, you, you might not have picked up on it, but Dries is proposing an, um, an automatic updates initiative, but um, uh, some work around Composer might actually end up as part of that. Um, so there, we might see um, better practices and better, more complete Drupal.org support um, for using Composer for dependency management as a whole come out of the automatic updates initiative because it's the, the, the work is sort of coupled. Um, so 
that's something to keep an eye on if you're interested, um, is the, the automatic update initiative, whatever it becomes. That's just starting to get started um, with discussions with the DA this week, though. They haven't even raised funding or anything, but there might be funding campaigns where um, like uh, Drupal shops and hosting providers or so forth are invited to invest in this initiative. So if it's something that's important for your business, keep an eye out for that and, and you know, maybe earmark some of your 2018 budget for that initiative. Um, there's also the Drupal org project on Drupal.org and they have, a, um, which I guess is the version of the project module that runs on Drupal.org and they have a path forward for compose a meta issue. And they have at least a couple um, issues, it seems like one is to, like, to list their, how to require the project, but I don't know if they, it doesn't look like I haven't seen one that says, you know, list the dependencies from the composer.json, but that's potentially something we could suggest and provide patches for. So, you know, you could potentially look at a project and say, like, I forget you were saying that you update and say this needs um, the latest version of Drupal, but, you know, if we, if we provided a patch to that project, that could potentially something just be automatic so that you wouldn't, and other people who aren't doing it wouldn't have to do it. They would just be like, this requires 8.3. So I think even if we're encouraging people to use Composer, a lot of people are still at least going to the project page to read about it before they actually download it. So um, that could maybe like flag them to say, okay, you know, I should, you know, all of these projects are on the latest version, so I should be, or I'm not, so I'm, severely restricted on the number of projects I can use. Um, so the dependencies is there, and I think also if we just, if there was something that says this is the, re, you know, suggested way to require a project, but um, I think the document, like sort of the auto documentation would be pretty big as far as like, could also tell you automatically which modules it requires just in general, but the versions of core would be big. I'm actually going to ask a question this time instead of spouting information off the top of my head. Um, so uh, earlier, you, I, I didn't quite under, follow on a slide where you, um, you had the list of the optional dependencies, the integrations that Lingotech provides. I didn't quite follow what you were saying about um, uh, how, how those are surfaced, that you're doing, are you doing it automatically from tests? Like I, I didn't, like the, the right sidebar there. I didn't yeah, this, the back this comes there. from the release uh, page. Oh, so it release. is in the sidebar where it yeah. has that list. Yeah. yeah. So I, I make core releases, so I don't ever see what this looks like for Contrib. And for core, it's this huge yeah. long list that's not even valid information. So, um, but it, it did you say that it does it from, it discovers it based on the tests that are provided with the module, or did I misunderstand that? No. Uh, the thing so is that we have optional dependencies for the modules we are compatible with, and we have test coverage for it. Um, so we have like an optional dependence uh, for, for where, downloading where do you the test for the those? Test. Are, they, are those declared in the info YAML file or info YAML file, it and they right. can be in the composer. Yes, I, I obviously don't ever yeah. <laughs> like. There's no such thing as optional dependencies for course. So I'm not familiar with it, but um, I guess I can just look on the Lingotech project page too and see look look in the code base. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So if there are not any more comments, uh, yeah, so as I said, this is some of the bibliography I used, uh, and I want to thank uh, some people w which uh, gave feedback on, on this topic or created content that I could base on this talk, and thank you all for coming and sharing your thoughts. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> I highlighted some issues that will make uh, uh, forward and backward compatibility better, so it's a good way to contribute in the sprint uh, tomorrow, also the at internal uh, uh, table. So join us and remember to give feedback of DrupalCon. Um, this is actually something um, that interests me. Like, 
when I want to contribute to core or contrib modules, um, I do that in a, in a way that I'm familiar with, like providing patches. But how do you do that for Drupal.org? Because like, you don't have the code base, so all you can do is... You just have a theme. You what? You can have a theme. The theme, okay. And a sandbox yeah. environment. I don't remember the exact details, but basically you can get a sandbox with uh, even a database dump, right? Um, and so, yeah, a sanitized database dump so you can't access passwords, hashes, and whatnot. I'm imagining, hoping. <laughs> so it's actually a totally empty one, so you, you get to be Dries <laughs> in your nice. sandbox um, of Drupal.org. But yeah, there's, a, there's an issue queue um, where you can, some, like, I don't remember if it's which did you queue it is, but if you post an issue in the webmasters project, they'll get you to the right place. Um, you can just say, I want to use a Drupal.org sandbox to work on developing feature X, and they have an automated uh, tool chain by which they can spin up a sandbox for you, and, and it has, um, it, it used to be what Tim was saying where you don't have the theme, but now it's actually, um, like there's, they, they don't do a local version anymore, it's just actually a full sandbox on their subdomain, so that's good. Um, although I, I will say it is like, if you find Drupal core contribution tr trying, um, contributing to Drupal.org is an order of magnitude more frustrating in my personal experience. Um, it's, there's, because there's just so much, you know, so much more going on and the Drupal Association has limited resources. Um, so like, just you know, be, be ready for that because um, it, it can take a very long time to get a small change in. Um, but in, in a situation where it's like important ecosystem changes like this, in some ways, it's actually more, it, it will probably go faster than contributing yourself um, to just um, you know, be constructive and supportive in the issues, discussing the issue, because um, uh, like the people who do work for the Drupal Association, when something becomes a priority, can actually get changes done really fast. Um, so that's the people to look for on Friday are uh, Neil Drum, Ryan Astlett, AKA Mixologic. Um, they'll, they can sort of like orient you to what's going on but also come to the panel that's right after this, I think. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah, the Drupal.org panel and we can. Yeah, I think you definitely should come to the panel that is right after this then. Um, okay, uh, well, in any case, um, I think what Jess said is all true, but then on top of that, I think perhaps for this particular area, it may be a little bit easier uh, to contribute to Drupal.org because it is like one specific tiny area that doesn't integrate with lots of external services. Usually the Integrations with the entire infrastructure is what makes it trickier to contribute because you don't have them locally. So I think this particular area, composer information to the project page, should be easier. <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, for that specific problem, uh, you want to look at the project release model that is inside the project project. <laughs> and, and also, uh, Based on that, uh, you probably, that is actually the, the place where you probably can add the information to the, to the project page. And yeah, I also want to say that, yeah, it's maybe, uh, it takes uh, some time to actually contribute to, to Dido Do, uh, but, but, <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to say that, yeah, it is possible and it's really r rewarding because uh, it is, it is a change that you can actually see and all people use. Yeah. So, so I would say that people around the uh, like Neil and, and Ryan, they will be really happy to help you put you in the right path to actually do the change. And so please do that on Friday. Well, thank you.